Hey everybody, today's guest is Vaden Todd Lewis, lead vocalist and guitarist for the Fort Worth, Texas alternative rock band, The Toadies. Together we take a deep dive into the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the smash hit single, Possum Kingdom, taken from their 1994 album, Rubberneck. The 90s were a wacky and weird time for music, and the Toadies fit in perfectly. Vaden agreed with that sentiment, going as far as to say that weird is what he was going for from a lyrical and musical standpoint. The track goes between some odd time signatures, and combined with the lyric and arrangement of the song, takes you on a cool little journey. Vaden mentioned that the song was recorded multiple times prior to this recording, and it was mostly an afterthought to him when Interscope brought it up that the band should re-record it for the album. It wasn't until he heard Andy Wallace's final mix that he knew they had made the right call. Oh, and you'll be as surprised as me to know that legions of goth kids were showing up to their shows when this song hit big, thinking the dark tone and imagery of the lyrics were speaking directly to them. For all this and a whole lot more, stick around. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Vaden, how's it going? Real good, man. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Are you in Fort Worth? I am. I'm at home. Nice. In my home studio. I understand we were rapping a little bit before we got uh, rolling here that you just got back from a seven and a half week tour with the Toadies. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks, man. It went, uh, went really well. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And was that your first tour since the pandemic? Have you played any, any shows prior to that? Or uh, We played a few shows here and there, but this tour was supposed to happen in 2020 and uh, it kept getting booted. So uh, we finally got to do it. Right on. Well, we're going to talk about the song Possum Kingdom today, which was the second single from the Toadies album Rubberneck released on August 23rd, 1994. And the single was released a week later on August 30th. And, you know, I was talking to my producer before the show, Vaden, about this song title. And the 90s were perfect for a title like this, Possum <laughs> Kingdom. And I have to ask, did your A&R guy or anybody from the label say, hey, this is like potential single here, you know, uh, can, can we call the song So Help Me Jesus or My Sweet Angel or something that, you know, is repeated in the song? Did anybody have a hang up about that? You know, uh, oddly enough, that was something they did not have a hang up about. I, now that I think <laughs> about it, that's like, why why not? I mean, Possum Kingdom and a Tyler or two off the top of my head that... The, there's no I don't say that anywhere in the song <laughs> yeah <laughs> that doesn't right. what you know uh-huh. that's, anyway uh yeah 90s there you go <laughs> my band ran into that <laughs> a lot with our a and guy back in the day he wanted to kill us he's like what does this title have to do with the song like no, we're gonna send it to radio no one's gonna know what it means it's like yeah but it's our art we stand behind it you know yeah. that whole argument uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> so what is possum kingdom i read it was it, it's a lake in north texas near fort worth yeah it's i think it's the largest uh i don't know i don't stick to that i don't, I don't know facts um <laughs> it's a uh it's a it's a large lake here uh in north texas it's about 45 minutes or an hour uh what uh east northeast of us here in fort worth and uh northwest i'm sorry that'd be another one of the facts that i don't know but um Anyway, it's a it's a beautiful giant lake, and we would go there. Uh, ooh, my family had a little bit of land there, and we'd go in the summer times, and and it was just full of creepy shit like uh, Hell's Gate and Devil's Island, and just you know, <laughs> awesome, you know. Yeah, yeah, awesome for a teenager exploring the the woods in the, in the area, right? Yeah, totally. Well, the band was formed in 89, and you guys released a few cassette self-releases and an EP titled Pleather before signing to Interscope. So take us back to that time period. Was Possum Kingdom on a, on a demo that you guys had recorded? I, I searched for a demo online. I couldn't find one. But what attracted Interscope to the band? Uh, that song, really. Um, no kidding. Yeah, I mean, that, they were not upfront about that because I think they knew me well enough to, to not go there. But... Uh, yeah, it was. We had demoed it on uh, Pleather, and we'd already uh, put it on. I think there was a demo, a little recording we did called "You're Cute." It had a silver foil cover, so you could look at yourself while you listened to it. We thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> and um, so, uh, yeah, by the, actually, by the time we got ready to do Rubberneck, they had to kind of wrestle me to put it on the record because I was kind of tired of it. I'd already recorded it twice. 
I've been there before where I wrote some songs early on and a label head wanted us to record. There, there's something there. And by that time, you're like, you've already played it live for four years. You're kind of over it. But right. it sounds, <laughs> sounds like they, they made the right call here. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you know how it works. If the, the label wants it and they get it, then they'll push it. And if they don't want it and they get it, they won't push it, you know? So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And how did, how did you get hooked up with Tom Rothrock and Rob Schnapp to produce the record? Cause you know, these guys worked on Beck's mellow gold. They had a label called bong load records, probably one of the best record label names uh, ever. Uh, sure. yeah. <laughs> and these guys really had no track record as far as I know, because you know, mellow gold from Beck was released on March 1st of 94. You guys would have probably been recording the record around then. Uh, uh, were you aware of Beck by the time you, you know you guys were recording with these guys? I'm uh, not aware of Beck. No, I think uh, yeah, it was actually '93 when we recorded with those guys. We had to sit on that record for almost a year. It sucked. Oh, uh, okay. But uh, there was another band that they produced called Wool, and uh, they had an EP uh, called Bud Spawn. Not an EP, a record called Bud Spawn, and it just sounded it sounded the most like uh, like ACDC of anything I'd heard. And that's what I, you know, it sounded like a lot, like a band in the room and sounded kick ass. So that's why we went with those guys. It's interesting you say that because this recording, uh, Possum Kingdom, sounds like a band in a room. They they definitely captured that, and that's what I, I love about the, the vibe of this. And let's talk about the length of the song for a second. Five minutes and nine seconds. That's <laughs> that's pretty long, you yeah. know? And, and as I listen through it, I'm like, no, all these parts work perfectly. The way the song ebbs and flows. Was there ever discussion again from Interscope? Hey, this song, you know, we got we got to trim some fat here, and, and I'm sure there was a radio edit too. Yeah, uh, they came at us about uh, wanting our input on a to me for a radio edit, and I just said no because I was just <laughs> that stupid. And uh, they, of course, went ahead and did one. They just didn't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Probably for the best. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I was pretty uh, pretty pig-headed back then. And, like, you know, my take on this whole thing, this whole career was, was well, it's not a career. My career is working at the record store back at home. And uh, I'll do this little record, and uh, I'll get to make the record I want. And it'll cost a, just a ton of money. And then the label will get fed up with me, and they'll drop me. And it's, uh, that'll be it. It'll be a great record, and I'll have to, they'll have to send me on a couple of tours at least. So I'll get to see the States and maybe beyond and uh, that'll be a great year and a half or two years and then you know here we are almost 30 years later <laughs> you set the bar pretty low there i guess to avoid disappointment if, if nothing else but pretty much yeah it tells you a little <laughs> bit tells you a little bit about self-esteem right there but uh <laughs> but i did get the record i wanted and it was it i guess part of that attitude helped me just really stay at it you know like uh can we do like two more passes on the vocals to get this smooth overdub and like no no we cannot well now did anybody at interscope have any suggestions about producers and when you brought them tom and rob were they like okay cool yeah we had there were several producers like their names escape me right now but we flew out and talked to several people in uh, san francisco and los angeles and all the while, they, they being the label, wanted a bigger name to mix it. Right. And that, that, that's where An Andy Wallace came in. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know how this shit works. So it's like the, the, what I heard filtering through was these guys don't cost enough, so they can't be that good. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's major label logic it's ludicrous because as you know so, someone has to get their start somewhere you know yeah, Bob yeah. rock any any of these guys they had to get right. their start somewhere but it, but i did get to work with andy wallace and that was just kick ass i get to sit in the studio and watch that guy work how was that experience i've had a couple people that have been on the show that have talked about uh getting to hang out with him and kind of peek over his shoulder said it was outstanding yeah he's just a cool guy and uh, it was just a really cool experience you know that was the first First time I'd been in New, in New York for more than a day, and I like took what two weeks in Manhattan and walking around and popping in twice a day to see how the mix is going. And you know, can't beat it. That's awesome. Well, again, the band formed in '89. The record came out in '94. So, when was uh, Possum Kingdom written? Do you recall? 
Oh, geez. Uh, that would have been probably 90. No kidding. Yeah, probably 90, 91. Okay. Yeah. And again, you've been, you've been playing this at your live shows. And what was the uh, reaction from audiences at, at that point before it became a, a, a huge hit for you guys? I couldn't tell you. It's like uh, early on, we would we just played to like 80 or 90 people in at home. You know, okay. and it was like, and they were there, but it was all of our community. It was like the musicians and their dates and, and, uh, and a few people that are just huge music, live music fans. And, uh, some of which I still know. And, you know, it's very supportive and, and cool. I guess what I was getting at, did, did you guys, was this song on your radar or did any of those 80 or 90 friends ever say to you, Hey, this song, there's something about it, something special or, or was it Interscope that finally said, this is the one? I think it would be Interscope. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, live, uh, the, before Rubberneck, we had a song that I thought was going to be the shit, and it was going to be, uh, it was called, uh, uh, I Hope You Die. <laughs> 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 Then I got the understanding that Possum Kingdom was going to be a thing. And I'm like, I don't want that vibe too much on the record. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, do you want to die? And I hope you die. I don't think I'm going to do that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. which is a good call because the other song is just kind of silly and, you know, what do you want? Gotcha. Well, we're going to jump into the track now. Again, the song's five minutes and nine seconds. And the intro has a guitar panned hard right. And the riff goes through uh, one cycle before verse one begins. And, you know, this song has such a quirky feel. It alternates between like that 7-4 and 4-4 time signature. And it's just the way the parts are constructed and the way that the arrangement is, it's just... It's one of the oddest songs, uh, and, <laughs> but the coolest, the coolest, oddest song. It's just so different. And I remember hearing this on the radio back in the day, and I just always thought like, gosh, that just nothing sounds like that. And diving into it the past couple days and listening to it however many times I have, 40 times, it's just, as I'm analyzing it, it's just so, so cool. It's such a great oh, arrangement. Thanks, man. Make up your mind Decide to walk with me Around the lake tonight Around the lake tonight By my side Make up your mind. Decide to walk with me. Around the lake tonight. Around the lake tonight. By my side. By my side. That's what I'm considering verse one. What do you got for us? Yeah, so um, I had had a dream. This is going to be a little bit of a... T take a walk with me, will you? I would love to. I would love to. Uh, I had a dream when I was uh, around this time, 90 or so, and I was dating this girl, and she was just a mess. And so was I, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, and I had a dream that I was going to a party uh, that she invited me to, and when I get to the party, the party is uh, everybody getting hammered and lighting themselves on fire and self-immolation. That was what the party was for, right? And it was like I woke up and I went, I need to break up with this woman immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I would say so. so Message received. So I wrote uh, I Burn. That's what I Burn is written about, that dream. And so uh, the idea that somebody would lure somebody into a situation that would create that kind of chaos and that kind of negative effect. And so I wrote I Burn, and I'm like, oh, that's just creepy and fucked up, and I like it. And then I'm thinking, well, 
what if it worked? You know, what if that, what if the idea of self-immolation to achieve a higher consciousness, what if that worked? Then what would this guy do? He's now, he's smoke. And so now he's going to, well, I would go try to find somebody to join me because now I'm all alone. I'm just smoke. And so that's what I wrote Possum Kingdom about. This guy now, he's just a spirit, disembodied spirit who uh, is trying to uh, lure this young lady to join him. Okay. The first four lines, it's just that intro guitar panned off right and vocals. There's a really cool pre-delay on that vocal, which is panned uh, pretty hard left, the the, the pre-delay, and the vocals even panned slightly left. Was that an Andy Wallace thing in the mix, or was that something that Rob and Tom created in the studio? Do you recall? Uh, as far as the alignment, like panning, I'm not sure who made that call, but it was Tom and Rob. We That was back in the day, so we... Uh, we took the 16 inch uh, master we they took the 16 inch master or 30 i'm sorry 32 track master and uh whatever i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about they took it off and uh, turned it upside down ah and then uh then recorded a delay and then flipped it back and then we had to go through all the channels to find out where it landed cuz everything reversed that's you know? so cool. And and for the listeners out there, <laughs> we what uh, Vaden's talking about, we could do with a push of a couple buttons now. But this is old yeah. school analog. You weren't recording to Pro Tools. They were going to tape. So any effect like that either had to be done how you just explained it or the mixer would put, put effects on it later. But it sounds like you went to tape with that effect, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were right there. And uh, I told him what I wanted. And and I actually, we had done this on the demo before also and uh, with, with a very few much um, uh, fewer tracks uh because of the budget but uh yeah it was it was actually kind of a fun half and a half a day of just messing with the that delay and getting in the right spot and the right length and everything that's awesome now you've been playing the song live and it had been written it had been around for some time do you recall anything changing about the arrangement lyrics or anything when you got into finally do this recording no not that i recall i mean it was pretty pretty laid out and i was like I mentioned, I was kind of over it. So it's like, well, this is what it is. Yeah, this is the song. So I'm not going to overthink it at that point. Yeah. And Tom and Rob, Tom and Rob also were really good about editing like, t- like Tyler, when I wrote that, I brought it in and it was, it was another epic journey. And uh, there was a whole section in the middle that just we didn't need. And I'm like, kind of fought with them at first. And then we, then we practiced it that way in the studio. And I'm like, oh, well, I see what you're saying now. So works way better but yeah so i they would have mentioned i think if they thought it needed to be any fat need to be trimmed fair enough well around the lake tonight at that lyric drums bass and another guitar a guitar comes in right there it almost sounds like there's a tube screamer on that guitar playing that signature riff panned off left around the lake tonight by my side Yeah, I, that was uh, Daryl uh, at the time. He was on that record. And uh, we went through tons of different ideas. We ran it through a Leslie at one point. Oh, and wow. Then, uh, just a bunch of things. So I'm not sure where he landed. They also, Tom and Rob also had uh, just an army of homemade amps and, uh, and just weird the bastard i think was one of them they all had cool names so you're telling me the guys from bong load records had weird effects and weird amps that's that's funny yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's awesome yeah um well that uh i'm calling it the signature hook the signature riff of the song panned off left uh and then there's a musical interlude And this uh, instrumental part cycles through four times. Halfway through, you get another vocal of that lyric, by my side. And at the very end there, on that guitar, I'm calling it the UFO sound. It's awesome. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It is so cool. And I talk about that so many times on this show, those little hooks within a song. You know, you don't think much about them as you're laying them down, but that is just integral to this song. If it wasn't there, it wouldn't be the same song. Uh, The next part is... Is a double pre chorus. I'm not gonna lie. I'll not be a gentleman behind the boathouse. I'll show you my dark secret.
I'm not going to lie. I'll not be a gentleman. Behind the boathouse, I'll show you my dark secret. I'm not going to lie. I want you for mine. My blushing bride, my lover, be my lover. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it was just that sinister uh, kind of, uh, you know, truth telling from the character. Again, this song had been around for a while. When you initially wrote it and you put these lyrics down, do you do a lot of self-editing or you just put something down and you just go with it? Because these are just so abstract and just, I'll use the word weird, but great. <laughs> <laughs> well, weird is a lot of what I was going for, you know, and always have been. Uh, you know, I, I came up on classic rock and, and whatnot because that's all you could get in Fort Worth. And uh then I heard uh, the Talking Heads and the Pixies within about a year of each other, and that just blew my mind. And like the the just the overall weirdness of the music and the weirdness of the lyrics, and uh, you know, so that kind of paired that weirdness together with my uh, at the time love of horror novels and Stephen King and all. I've got the Evil Dead poster behind me yeah i see you it. know so uh <laughs> yeah i love that stuff and uh that's always kind of in the back of my mind yeah well early 90s and again i think all the 90s but early 90s were, were a time for weird and i relished in it the weirder the better you know some of my, my favorite bands were, were very out there well this is again a double pre-chorus with drums bass and that guitar uh panned off right uh it's kind of broken down here uh halfway through on i'll show you my dark secret there's another musical interlude two times with that signature guitar lick again, panned off left, and it does this cool dive bomb this time before we get in uh, to the second half of pre-chorus one. Uh, the vocals on the second half go up an octave. I love the intensity there. And a guitar panned off left comes in playing the rhythm guitar along with the right. Uh, so now we have stereo guitars coming in the song for the first time. And the bass is doing a really great circular like walking bass part. It's yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, the, I wanted the bass and the drums to hold it all together from that herky jerky seven four stuff. Right, yeah. and you know, I always it is funny as a kid. I, I found myself zoning in on the bass a lot. I'm not a bass player, but I was always fascinated by it. You know, you 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 listen to songs like uh, first one that comes to mind is like Billy Jean by by Michael Jackson. Just if you just listen to the bass line, it could be its own song. You know, it's, oh yeah, it, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, it communicates, and and this bass part communicates with me like that. It's it, it's its own thing. If you just zone in on that, it's it, it's really cool. Well, right on, thanks, man. Yeah, I think this is pretty common knowledge, but I wrote all that stuff and like i really wanted the bass to fit underneath these chords a certain way and like to bring out certain notes that you don't ordinarily hear from a bass player like that on the turnaround Mm -hmm. that's just a weird seventh type descending so uh I just really wanted all that stuff to be called out. Well, I got a, a lot of questions as we comb through this, because there's a lot of stuff I'm scratching my head going, why? But they're great whys. They're like, why did you do it? <laughs> this part was here then. It's not there now. What made you decide that? And I just, I love to get inside people's minds and see what see what makes them tick. Well, the next part, I'm yeah. calling Chorus One. Don't be afraid. I didn't mean to scare you. So help me, Jesus. I think at this point, I, uh, you know, like I said, I'm writing from a character standpoint, like a Stephen King thing. And I thought, well, that's that's coming on a little strong, a little heavy on the first verse. So maybe I need to like, uh, you know, hey, uh, back off a little bit and make it a little nicer. The character, I mean, not me, but the, <laughs> if that right. makes any freaking sense at all. <laughs> well, <laughs> it does make sense. The strumming pattern here changes. It's like this cool ascending riff, and the stereo guitars and bass are playing that descending riff together there, and the bass is playing some really unique note choices in this part. They're just kind of up on, I don't know, past the 12th fret or something, doing some really cool high stuff and just... Odd, odd notes that are happening there, which is just great. <laughs> yeah, right on. Thanks. Yeah, that's uh, it was a lot of fun to construct, you know? Well, it, it's a lot of fun for me. I, I, I did an interview the other day, and, and the guy asked me, he said, so have you learned, you know, stuff from doing this songwriting podcast? Because I'm going on three years now with, with doing the show. I've done, I don't know, 140 episodes or whatever. I said, I learn stuff 
every time I do one of these. It's been it's been fantastic. You know, you, you get to a point sometimes where you plateau as a songwriter or you get complacent. And just this song, I wouldn't even know where to begin to try to write a song like this. And I mean that with the utmost sincerity. It's just so, like, my brain doesn't work like this. It's fascinating to me. And, uh, again, some of those note choices there are, are really awesome. Well, after Chorus 1, we get a two-bar reintro. At the end, the guitar panned off left does that UFO sound again right before verse 2. Jesus. I can promise you, you will stay as beautiful with dark hair and soft skin forever, forever. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, just uh, promising to preserve this person and uh, which, you know, is a lie, but uh, that was what that was about. Hey, everybody, we'll be right back with lots more with Vaden after a few words from our sponsors. Hey, everyone, this is Tuck from Fit for a King in Off-Road Minivan. Every week I bring you fun interviews alongside your favorite metalcore entertainers with my new podcast, Get Tucked. Join me every Monday with bands like Counterparts, Crystal Lake, like Moths to Flames, and many more. We play unsigned and undiscovered bands, deep dive into each artist's history, and of course provide the greatest breakdowns in current metalcore. Tune in to Get Tucked every Monday, out now through Sound Talent Media. And now, back to the show. Did anybody ever ask you if this was like about a love interest or if it was a love song? I didn't take it as that. I'm like, there's something more to this than, uh, you know, but y- you could look at this, you know, my sweet angel and things like that. Did anybody ever uh, take that away from the, the lyrics? I'm sure I got that at some point. Uh, mostly I got, is this a vampire song? Really? Yeah, that was the number one question. No kidding. I, I don't I yeah. don't really pick up on a goth vibe here. <laughs> yeah, me neither. But uh, but speaking of which, uh, the, when the single hit, uh, we were on tour and we went through Florida and there was just an army of goth kids, full regalia, like for us. Really? Who were very disappointed in the rest of the set. <laughs> 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 well, I'm I'm from Florida. I would have been a, loved to have been a fly on, on the wall at some of those shows to, to see that because uh, the, the the goth kids were alive and well in the '90s. I can attest. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, right around forever on this verse, the stereo guitars come in, but no signature guitar lick panned off left, and that's my my question. Why why not there? Why didn't that come in? We had already drilled it home pretty good. And I wanted to, A, make sure I didn't overuse it, and B, I kind of like it when you expect to hear something and it's not there and you almost, you know, you kind of hear it anyway. Right. Well, again, I've heard this song I don't know how many times, you know, since 94, but putting it under the microscope, I had to listen to this part like three or four times. I'm going, I kept rewinding it going... Why does this sound weird? And it finally it jumped out. The the lick's not there. You'd think it would hit me over yeah. the head. Like it would be obvious. Uh, duh, the lick's not there. But I couldn't figure out why this was making me feel different. And finally it dawned on me that the, the lick's not there. <laughs> One thing I've kind of stumbled onto with this band uh, or, or pulled out of the music that I've listened to my whole life is I kind of dig it whenever a band just goes into a groove. And just kind of just sits in it for a little bit. And nobody is trying to show off. It's like we're all doing the same. We're all on the same page. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And you want to talk about uh, getting into a groove later in the song, you get into a groove. And I mean, you guys are just it's almost like and I was never into 
I guess the word would be jam bands. You know, it was never really my thing of a band that'll go off and play, you know, 100 and, you know, 28 bars for, you know, and, and bore people. But uh, that's not what, <laughs> that's not, that's not what I get here. Again, I, I think that you guys get locked in this zone and, and this, this whole thing just takes you on a ride. Well, pre-chorus two uh, comes in here and those stereo guitars uh, continue through this, this part. Make up your mind, make up your mind, and I'll promise you. And on the first make up your mind, that's sung in a low register, and the last two are up an octave there. Yeah. Is that how you had been singing it for the longest time, or was that something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? I love that. Very, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, you know, probably a lot of that came from uh, just these crappy sound systems and these little clubs we'd play at. And if I didn't get louder when the band got louder, I was just gone. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that a thousand percent. That's, that's, that's amazing because, uh, yeah, especially in the days when we didn't have our own sound guys, right? Yep. Absolute nightmare. Well, I love that. I love that the first line is just kind of, you're just kind of melancholy, kind of the, the vibe you've been giving, and then it just goes up there, which is really cool. Then we get into chorus two. I will treat you well, my sweet angel, so help me Jesus. And on this chorus, we don't get any harmonies in this song, but on this chorus, on the first two lines, there's double uh, vocals there. They're in unison that comes on those two lines only. Why there? You know, that would be a Tom and Rob question, because uh, seriously, like I didn't want uh, I didn't want any doubling. I didn't want any overdubs. I wanted live like a live band. And, you know, at the time, I didn't realize that all of my favorite songs had all that stuff that I was trying not to do. <laughs> Uh, because I'd never been in a professional, like, big recording studio. So, yeah, they would have, they, if it, after about the second day of having to deal with me, they would, uh, <laughs> they would do things like, all right, well, I think we can beat the take. And they would have me do it again. And that was secretly the overdub. And it's like, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. So, uh, and I'm glad they did it, uh, but uh, it, they used it to great effect, too, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's the old producer trick, right? Hey, can just this time, can you just kind of go up on those last three words just, just so we have it? I'm like, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I know it's going to make the record. Don't lie to me, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, the, also on chorus two here, we got a lyric change. Was there any talk of, hey, maybe we should keep this the same because it's, it's the chorus hook or no, it's just going to be different? I don't recall any talk about that, uh, but I do, you know, uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but I bring that first one back, I believe at the, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, part of me was aware that repetition is a good thing. Right. And of course, <laughs> of course we get the, so help me Jesus, which is just an, an epic hook. And the way you sing that is just, is, is great. After chorus two, we go into a two bar buildup and it's a very subtle melancholy. Hey, Hey, kind of, yeah. Where you trail off there and we get into the bridge here. Jesus. Give it up to me. Give it up to me. Do you want to be my angel? And that is said three times. And at the very last time, you get a, a so help me, like this plea. You can just kind of feel the uh, a, a aggression there. The first two times this uh, goes through, the guitar on the right is playful, but the guitar left is playing eighth notes with the bass. So the whole feel changes there. It's great. My guitar is the backbeat. The chugs. Yeah. And uh, 
Yeah, and I like just how they play off of each other. So when they sync up, it's that much more impactful. And also, there's like I pulled out of the back to the time signatures changes. This two bars of six and then two bars of four. If you count out those the, the turnarounds, it, it was starting to drive me batty. <laughs> 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 it's 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 odd. It's odd. The chords are odd with it. The whole thing kind of just does this push and pull as I'm listening to it. And this part in particular, you know, if you were going to achieve that live band sound, I closed my eyes last night and I'm listening to it and I'm going, I feel like I'm in the room with you guys. Like if I have a good pair of headphones on and I'm kind of muffled a little bit, but I'm in the room with you and uh, cool. the drums in particular, just like there's a lot of space, but they're not like big and boomy, like eighties reverb. They got their space, but they sound big, but they're still tight. It's a, it's a cool mix. Yeah. Yeah. We had a, just a, we did this at Philo's ranch, which I believe is gone now, but it was up in Mendocino County and it was modeled after a famous studio that I should know the name of, but I do not. But uh, fantastic room sounds, and they just, like, Tom and Rob just had that place tricked out with, you know, especially for the drums, just mics everywhere. It's it's such a cool sound. I, I'd written in my notes that this part is sludgy. <laughs> the adjective that came to, came to mind, it just, it just got this... It, it's it's like heavy it's like it's like full the third time around of the give it up to me give it up to me do you want to be my angel uh that guitar panned off to the left starts strumming the rhythm with the guitar on the right and the vocals go up an octave here so it just gets a little more urgent there at the end on so help me the drums play for four bars while the guitars ring out uh guitar left is doing some cool whammy bar like feedback and then the bass and the guitar panned off right are playing that walking bass part again for two times before we get into what i'm calling verse three is just such a trip like again i feel like i'm in the room with you guys there it's really cool uh it's just a fun part to get to <laughs> when you were doing this and tracking this do you know and i'm assuming all at least three of you were in the room bass drums guitar tracking mm -hmm. do you recall like what take this was no i do not okay um geez couldn't tell you but yeah we would we would do the uh initial tracking you know everything was isolated and we would do the initial throw i guess what i'm asking you guys had played this song for so much did you have to labor over this one because you know as well as i do you get in the studio sometimes especially when you got a, a different set of eyes like tom and rob on it yeah you had already recorded it but now they're like well wait a second what if we brought the click back a little bit or what if we did this and did you record this to a click this was i believe recorded to a click yes okay, okay. but it's a it's a very forgiving click and i believe they would <laughs> they would like just pull it out whenever they needed to because you know, we didn't want to sound sterile. But uh, as far as uh, laboring over it, no. I mean, uh, over the drums, man, uh, Mark Rezacek, our drummer, he's just one take Jake. He's like, he's it's insane. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I, I definitely, it's definitely a tight performance. Don't get me wrong. But I feel some breathing. I feel, I feel some push and pull here slightly. Just like, it just kind of takes you on a ride. It's not, it's not stiff by any means. It's not on, the, yeah, on yeah. some crazy grid. Yeah, exactly. Well, the lyric for verse three is just be my angel three times that cool pre-delay on the vocals comes back the band is still broke down uh continuing that walking bass riff with the guitar panned left which is feeding back 
into pre-chorus three. And I've read, you know, a, a number of lyrics. Where's the song going lyrically at this point? Uh, I think I'm just trying to get it to, well, I know. I wanted to tear it all down and layer back on and keep layering on until we just bring it home. to die i promise you it's just those two lyrics the do you want to die is four times the pre-delay again is on that vocals i keep bringing up that pre-delay thing because it's so cool it's just it's it's haunting you know i guess that's a that's one for the goth kids that that haunting part there (laughs) (laughs) the uh the guitar right gets way more playful here and the guitar pan left is still feeding back through this whole part do you want to die happens four more times and the stereo guitars come back in and the band just gets really loud kind of builds to this crescendo and then you hit chorus three And we bring back the lyric from chorus two for chorus three here. I will treat you well, my sweet angel. So help me, Jesus. And we get three more Jesuses after that. On the first two lines, uh, the double unison vocals come in just for those two lines that happened the time previous. No other harmonies in the song. I got to say that Tom and Rob, in my opinion, made the right car. Something really cool about that, especially when you come back by yourself and say, so help me, Jesus. It brings it personal again. Yeah, it makes it come right up front. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's very yeah, cool. That. And then we get the you're kind of sputtering out the whole band, even the kind of delivery of the vocal Jesus. It's kind of like it's labored here at the end almost. And the band uh, retards uh, all together and the song just comes to an end. Take us back now to your, you're hearing these mixes. You said you were with Andy Wallace and, and this, this comes back at you. You know, you had already recorded it and you know, you kind of, had, at this point, it's almost an afterthought. It's like, fine, the label wants us to record it. What did you think about this recording coming back? Oh, man. Uh, uh, I was glad that I did it. <laughs> it didn't stick to my guns. There's, it's night and day going into a studio and saving up all your money and getting to spend six hours to do uh, six songs, you know, as opposed to untold hundreds of thousands of dollars in a real studio and with real producers, it's just night and day the way it sounds. It's just great. And one last thing, what was that like? You know, you guys weren't uh, upstarts. I mean, you had been around for a number of years. You've been hitting all the clubs and, and, and doing that whole grind. And all of a sudden, this song gets picked up on commercial radio. It was all over the place in 94 and 95. That had to be incredible. Yeah, it was. It would actually... Uh... It actually took a little bit for it to take off. We went on the first two tours were van tours opening up for uh, punk bands because they didn't know what to do with us. Mm -hmm. So we got spat on a lot. And uh, then we started opening for Bush, another van tour. And it was during that tour that this song started to catch on. So we were already, I don't know, a year in on, you know, just being on the road constantly. So, uh, but it was, it was pretty cool i mean uh, like we started an opening for bush and then we moved up to a bus and then gradually the venues got larger and uh, you know how it goes and like at some point we're like hey this is starting to work you know 
Yeah, that is that that is awesome. Well, you know, again, you you guys have, have have never stopped. You just got back on a seven and a half week tour, and uh, you have seven albums total. The most recent being the Lower Side of Uptown, uh, released in 2017. So, congratulations, man! You're you you've had a one heck of a career. And if there's anything else you'd like to leave the listeners right now, what's coming up with you and the band? Uh, now now be the time to do it. Yeah, man. Well, we uh, we used this tour to uh, work on material that I'd been writing over the last uh, forever. It seems like forever since the lockdown and everything. So uh, yeah, we those have gone over really well. And uh, we've got a good handful of songs saved up. The plan is to go in next year to record a new album and... And if he's available and we're available at the same time, we're uh, we're hoping to work with Steve Albini on this one. Oh, that'd be killer. That'd be awesome. Yeah, always wanted to, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for sitting in with us today, Vade, and I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hey, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Vaden Todd Lewis. We got to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors, but don't go anywhere. We got lots more. Chris makes a podcast coming up. Hey, what's up? This is Blake Wyland. I'm the host of the Tone Mob podcast. It's a show where I interview guitar people about guitar stuff. We talk about their pedals, their amps, their accessories, their preferences, all that stuff, as well as a healthy dose of whatever comes up. Topics have ranged from aliens to addiction and anywhere in between. Oh yeah, and pizza. We're definitely going to be talking about pizza. So get the show wherever you're listening to this podcast at. Just search The Tone Mob in your search bar and it will pop right up. Come join us. We're having a lot of fun. Thanks for checking it out. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is email your best song via mp3 only and a short bio to ban you might not know at gmail.com this week's featured artist is the up fucks a ska punk band from asbury park new jersey they just released a full-length album on bad time records called coastal collapse here's a snippet of their song drowning The Rap with Chris and Chris. Chris, listeners of the podcast have wanted a Toadies episode for a long time. I told Vaden that. I'm glad we could finally make it happen. And I think it was worth the wait. I think he was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was It was awesome. I'm really glad that he agreed with weird as one of my uh, yeah. <laughs> word choices to describe this song. What a weird song to make it onto pop radio. Dude, to be a hit rock song, there's so many interesting things between the feel of the song and the time signature stuff, the lyrics, the chord choices it definitely feels exactly like you're at a creepy lake you know that's that's the only way i could explain it i thought it was really funny that he said that it's it was a hit among goth people (laughs) who started showing up to the shows but then they're like oh the rest of these songs aren't you know necessarily like this i thought that was pretty funny yeah and i've often wondered i've said it many times and we haven't seen it too much on the show surprisingly that did someone just pick up a pen and write a song that didn't really mean anything and yeah i mean the uh, possum kingdom lake was kind of the inspiration behind this he would go there as a kid but you know i I was kind of prying him a couple of times about lyrics and you know he just kind of was like yeah that's just you know there, there wasn't much here but there doesn't need to be he was going for weird and it's definitely weird this was kind of touched on this a little bit this was kind of a sequel to a song yeah it was a sequel to another song and it was about self-immolation and once you're this ghost <laughs> that's that's burnt trying to convince someone else to to do that too i mean it's definitely never i don't think there's ever been another song with that subject matter you know so so just that in itself knowing it's about that is cool enough and everything just kind of contributes to that feel i thought it was pretty funny and you you 
kind of called him out on this, how low he set the bar for releasing an <laughs> album on a major label. He's like, yeah, this is an awesome way for me. This is my chance to make the record I want to make and kind of like whatever happens, happens. I feel like most people would be like, okay, well, I got to take advantage of this opportunity and I got to make sure that I do all the right things. It was kind of like, no, I'm going to make the album I want to make. And, you know, I'll have my moment for a year and a half or two years. And here we are, whatever, how many years later, 30 years later or whatever it's been since this song, talking about this song. Yeah. And I think that really speaks to going into a project, not thinking about like, is the radio going to like this song? Is the whatever? And just making your art making your art the way you want to make it i think that's pretty inspiring yeah i told him he was setting himself up to not be disappointed which <laughs> basically, <Right. laughs> basically a, a good way to take it you were speaking of the song i burn he was referencing which yeah he said it was a story about cult members uh immolating themselves to ascend to a higher plane it's just such a such a trip uh and uh just just uh, the, describing possum lake you know i used to go to this lake in michigan that was i don't know if it was as creepy as this but there's there's always stories of the woods and the lake that are kind of kind of creepy in and of themselves but um yeah the the, the fact that he, he said goth kids uh gravitated towards the song was was pretty funny it makes sense it makes sense that people that like he brought up being inspired by stephen king and like the evil dead <laughs> movies and stuff and now that makes sense it makes sense that people would be that would be into horror movies and goth music and you know how many Lesson Jake songs are there about burning yourself to ascend to a higher plane probably not that many I would assume well right? there's, there's actually one believe it or not really yes there's a song on our GNV FLA record called Malachi Richter's Liquor is Quicker and Malachi uh, Richter was somebody I believe he was protesting Oh, was it 9-11 or something or thought there was a conspiracy? He said he set himself on fire. Wow. So, yeah, we, we did have a song about self-immolation, but uh, it didn't didn't take it uh, uh, the, the take of, of what this song did. You know, this track, and I don't know, did you ever have any punchline songs that you re-recorded, and did someone want you to re-record them? Because Less Than Jake, as you know, had a, a number of songs that we re-recorded. Johnny Quest, Jen Doesn't Like Me Anymore, Look What Happened, and, and, and a couple others. And by the time that you, know, you record it for the third time, it is kind of an afterthought. And even even uh, uh, Vaden said it. He's just like, yeah, I just... You know, the label wants us to record is like, whatever, we're going to go in and record it. It wasn't until he heard that mix come back from Andy Wallace. He's like, OK, we got something here. Right. Yeah. There, There's a song, an old punchline song, kind of a popular one for, for us among our fans called Heart Transplant that we had recorded. Like he said, we had recorded on a shoestring budget, you know, self-financed. And then once we signed to Fuel by Ramen, now we had a budget. We were in a real studio with a producer and we recorded it. But of course, Chris, as you know, the diehards are going to be like, I like the old version better. <laughs> like that's always, that's always going to be a thing, even if it's dramatically yeah. better. I wonder, I wonder if he experienced that <laughs> at all. Like, oh, we like the old version better. I, I highly, <laughs> I highly doubt it with how good this song sounds but i'm sure there were a few yeah you know and, and it, it's funny that we talked about the title a little bit i'm surprised no one at the label said something about you want to name the single possum kingdom and at least name it so help me jesus or something because that was a huge thing you wanted it to connect with radio listeners art from everclear recently said you know it's his a guy said it doesn't say santa monica anywhere in the song right. like why do you want to call it santa monica he's like that's the name of the song we're running with it you know that was a very popular thing to do an our world like in the punk rock world to name a song you don't say the title yeah. of the song like uh which you know it it benefits you for seo purposes for people being able to search for it if they know the name of it instead of like naming something that's been that like this song's called stop and that there's like five thousand songs named that but anyway hey something that i couple things i thought were funny i wanted to mention one and I think we've talked about this a few times. He brought up how when you're playing the small 
punk rock venues or whatever you're playing with the crappy sound systems that you have to sing in that higher octave for people to even hear to try to sing in a lower octave in a bad sound system people aren't going to hear the vocals whatsoever they have a hard enough time hearing them when you are singing in a higher octave oh i remember what episode jamie when jamie wolford from the stereo was on he talked yeah. about that having to sing loud enough and in and high enough that people can actually hear the vocals i thought that was funny that he mentioned that and i also thought it was funny that he talked about how the producers kind of tricked him into <laughs> into doing doubles you know yep. just uh, just do it again just so we so we can hear it uh-huh i mean it's going to end up on the final recording i've i've been down that road before which i i could totally relate to that it's awesome right and hey something I wanted to mention for sure because I know I've had several friends say this to me about how they acquired the Toadies album in the 90s and in the 80s and before there were a couple things known as BMG and Columbia House these were these sort of scammy type things where you would get like 11 CDs for a penny but then you were enrolled into a like monthly charge or something I was never allowed to do it I never went and did it but I had lots of friends who like took advantage of that <laughs> and got the CDs and uh, Toadie's album was always on there. And so many people, I mean, I wonder if that still existed. Were you, do you remember if you guys were ever on one of those? We, or was we it- were. Losing Streak definitely was. I remember Losing Streak was on that. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. I mean, what a, what another weird way for people to discover music is like, well, I got to get 11 albums. This is one of the 20 rock yeah. albums on here, even if you weren't that familiar with it. And that was at a time where if you got an album, it wasn't like you're just going to toss it aside. You're going to actually give it a chance because you you own it. You don't have all the songs in the world at your fingertips. And, I, you know, I'm not saying that I'm sure that being on MTV and having this big hit was a big part of it, but it probably couldn't hurt that lots of people were getting your album through one of these things like this. I can't believe it took us this long to talk about that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, another weird way to acquire something is by going to our after party, Chris, and you can hear us talk more. It's not that weird. <laughs> it's a, you just have to go to ChrisDemakes.com oh. and sign up. For, you got to sign up for the Chris Demakes, a podcast supporting cast at ChrisDemakes.com. Yes, you'll get a weekly bonus episode of our other podcast called The After Party. There's a giant back catalog of it. All the episodes are fun. 100% of them are fun, I will promise. And on top of that, for a few bucks a month, you're supporting Chris to Makes a Podcast. You keep getting amazing episodes like today's with Vaden Todd Lewis of the Toadies. You guys have been asking for a Toadies episode forever, and we came through. Vaden came through, but, you know, hey, we <laughs> we tracked him down and got him to come on, right? So we're going to do our best to keep bringing you the best episodes possible as, uh, as we continue here. That's right. We do our best to deliver. If you haven't already, please join the Krista Makes a Podcast Facebook group. It is awesome. It's a lot of fun. We get in crazy, crazy discussions, and, uh, yeah, please, uh, if you're not already, please join become a member it's a lot of fun please give me a follow on instagram at less than chris d i'd appreciate that too and i want to thank this week's guest vaden todd lewis for sitting in with us and we'll see you next week hey there i am johnny christ from avenge sevenfold and i've got a podcast called drinks with johnny you're gonna want to check out i sit down with a bunch of different people from all different walks of life from professional wrestlers to actors comedians fighters musicians everything in between i'm just looking to make some friends and have a good time doing it so if that sounds like something you're into go check out drinks with johnny streaming everywhere now hey this is chris santos host of delirious nomads the blacklight media podcast part of the sound talent media podcast network delirious nomads is a podcast about all things heavy metal as well as breakdowns of your favorite combat sports and me being a chef and all we'll be riffing on some food talk every week with very special guests from across the globe. Listen and subscribe at soundtalentmedia.com.